you are too. Looking forward to uh, time of fellowship through the evening around God's Word. Um, it's a blessing to be here. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 this evening. 1 <clears throat> Peter chapter 3. Uh, in just a moment here, we'll be reading verses 8 through 15 as we continue our series uh, entitled One Another. Right, for several months now, we've been seeking understanding from God's Word together about how God wants us to relate to each other within a local church body. And we've been praying that God would grow and deepen the level of intimacy that we have with one another uh, right here at True North Baptist Church as we seek to serve Him together. It should be the desire of every church. So today we're going to learn that God's intent is that we would have compassion on one another. Have compassion on one another. Uh, today we're going to uh, we're going to dig into that some, and how many of you would agree that uh, the world needs to see a genuine model of biblical compassion? Amen. I'm very excited about sharing this truth with you today um, from God's Word. And, uh, I know you guys have been up and down and up and down a couple of times here, but I'm going to ask you to all stand together as we read God's Word. Uh, it's so very important that we enter God's presence with reverence and recognition that what we're about to read here has the power to permanently change us so that when we leave tonight, uh, we're never the same again. That should be our desire. And uh, uh, may God grant us that understanding as we dig into 1 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in verse 8, the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you for the time that we've had to lift our hearts to you in praise through these songs. Thank you for the tremendous truths that they convey. Thank you for the time of fellowship that we can enjoy together. But now uh, we open your word, and Lord, we need to hear from you. We pray, as we always do, that you would open our understanding to your truth. I pray that you would shape us to be compassionate church members and husbands and wives and neighbors and brothers and sisters and parents and co-workers. Uh, teach us how we can make a difference in this world and in eternity through having compassion one of another as your word commands. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> well, we're absolutely bombarded in our world by negative news, aren't we? If you follow the news at all over the past couple of weeks, you certainly are going to feel weighed down by that. There's never been a shortage of catastrophes in our world, but with modern technology, it's nearly impossible to avoid it. Since most people own TVs and social media accounts and smart devices, uh, you generally can't go a day, if even an hour, without hearing of some devastation or some catastrophic problem that's erupted. And as far as the media is concerned, of course, the more outlandish and the more graphic, the better. Whether it's wildfires or shootings or crime or disease or riots uh, or just people constantly infernally yapping at each other and disagreeing over something, we are just inundated by these daily events um, to the point that we can very easily become desensitized and we can become calloused to much of the heartache and the suffering and the difficulty and the problems of other people. Now, there's so much negativity and there's so much harshness that we can really train ourselves to turn a deaf ear towards people's needs very easily. We can turn a deaf ear towards, uh, towards hearing and helping people in their times of need. And for us, uh, while most of those disasters don't 
generally happen right around us and don't very personally touch us. Uh, if it's not right on our doorstep, it's very easy for us to lack feeling or empathy for other people's problems. And it becomes very easy to get into the mindset that if it doesn't affect me directly, well, it really doesn't matter. That's one reason that, uh, that leaders, um, especially uh, ought to visit those whose lives are touched by problems and disasters. Our president uh, has been uh, criticized, of course, as he always is for anything that he does, no matter what it is, um, for going and visiting the, the scene of, um, uh, of some devastation that happened in a church there in Washington, D.C. Uh, but, uh, but, but whether it's church leaders or whether it's political leaders, uh, <clears throat> it's important to go and reach down and be able to see other people's problems and be able to empathize with them. It's a biblical principle. Ezekiel experienced this when he would heard about the difficulty that was experienced by the Israelites in captivity, and he really wasn't touched by it all that deeply until he says this, I came and I sat where they sat, and I remained there astonished among them seven days. And he went and he saw, and he was deeply impressed by that. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, mine eye affecteth mine heart, all right? And so what you see when you go and you actually experience and are touched by someone else's problems, then it tends to touch your heart. And, and so sometimes uh, we just don't see it like we ought to. Uh, there's much in the way of information today, but we don't generally have the compassion that we should. And so as we look at our text here this morning, or this, this evening, the Bible tells us in verse 8, having compassion one of another. And I want to talk to you about true compassion today, not what the world may define it as, but what the scriptures define it as. The word in the Greek is asumpasko. It literally means suffering or feeling alike with another person. Suffering or feeling alike. What they feel, you feel. Uh, it involves seeing their need and doing something about it. And uh, that should that concept should flow very naturally from the command that we looked at last week we considered the command to exhort one another you should remember that that uh, that that Greek word for exhort uh, is uh, basically parakletos or, or a similar variance of that and it has to do just like the Holy Spirit does with his church with us coming alongside of someone that's experiencing difficulty and then taking this next link of the chain and showing compassion towards them how many of you are thankful that Jesus Christ had compassion on us? He observed the desperate need, the anguish of our souls, wallowing in darkness, wallowing in the quagmire of sin. The Bible teaches us that he left the splendor of heaven and with a heart of love and compassion, he came to meet our needs. And we're called upon to reflect that as God's people. What is it that moves a missionary or an evangelist to leave everything and relocate to another part of the world while other people may sit firmly entrenched in their comforts and say, I would never want to leave my home and my friends and my family and my comforts. What's well, a heart of compassion that focuses on the desperate need of others rather than self. I believe that God wants all of our hearts to be hearts of sincere compassion. He wants all of us to have compassion of one another and, um, and on those that we minister to outside of this church as well. And so this involves getting our eyes off of ourselves and getting our eyes and hearts onto other people. And so the first thing that I want to show you from this scripture that we look at in 1 Peter chapter 3 today is the, uh, the realm of compassion, the realm of compassion, where it operates, and specifically, again, we're going to take a biblical definition here from what we've read tonight in First Peter. First of all, as we talk about the realm in which this operates, there ought to be a unified mindset in it. Verse 8 begins with, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Notice that God intends for there to be a unified mindset of compassion that permeates the entire church body. 
Remember that the context of these one another commands is directed at local churches, and it's the way that God would have us to relate to one another. Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Now, some people in the Christian life try to compartmentalize some of these types of spiritual commands. I've had some people claim that they just really aren't an extrovert and they don't have the gift of gab and therefore they really can't be good witnesses for Jesus. The problem with that is that Jesus didn't say go into all the world and preach the gospel if you have the gift of gab. He just told his whole church to be witnesses. Sometimes I've had people say that they really don't have a lot of money or it doesn't fit into their priorities yet and so they just can't give. And the problem with that is that Jesus doesn't say to give when you get a lot of money. He wants us all to give at whatever level we can. He just wants us all to be involved. And some people have said to me, I'm not the compassionate type. Uh, I don't feel like other people feel. I see everything very logically. But God says this, no, the realm of compassion isn't just for those who have extra sensitive or emotional hearts. <laughs> The realm of compassion is actually the mind. It's uh, the will. It's not the emotions. Now, there may be some emotion that becomes attached to it, but it's driven from the mind, having the same mind. Now, some people are certainly especially gifted by the Lord in the area of evangelism, in the area of giving, in the area of mercy. Those are all spiritual gifts that are supernaturally bestowed by the Holy Spirit to function in a very special way in a church. But all three of those are also specifically commanded to be developed by all members of a church as well. No one's exempt. And so we're all to be of one mind and be united in this sense, in our effort, in our choice, in our selection to engage in this important work. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2 says something similar. He says, uh, Paul says this, Fulfill ye my joy to the church at Philippi, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And in our text today, God says that he wants us all to have this mindset of compassion. It is to be clearly felt and clearly known in this church body if we're going to please God and operate the way that he wants us to. In World War II, 10 days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, there was a story that began to unfold in a little, little city called North Platte, Nebraska. Living in North Platte, Nebraska were men that constituted Nebraska National Guard Company Delta. Uh, they'd shipped off already to prepare for deployment when the United States entered the war. And the residents of North Platte had been told that their young men were gonna be coming through uh, on the train, there was a major train depot there, and that they would be passing through North Platte on their way to deploy to war. And so a lot of ladies and residents of the city rallied together and they made care packages consisting of sandwiches and different snacks and other uh, helpful items to encourage the soldiers as they came through. And they all lined up at the train depot, but as the soldiers stepped off the train, it wasn't their, uh, their sons from the Nebraska National Guard, it was the Kansas National Guard that was there a different company Delta and all these soldiers were unknown to the residents of that city and for a few minutes they all just stood there sheepishly looking at one another and finally there was one lady that uh, that broke the standoff and she went up to a young soldier and handed him the care package with a sandwich and some food presumably intended for her own son and she thanked him for serving our country as he prepared to head for what was very likely to be the most difficult thing that he ever faced in this life. After she did that, it broke the ice and all the other folks began to give their items to the other soldiers. And almost immediately after that day, the town put together an organization that would allow uh, everybody to create lunches and care packages for all the soldiers coming through. And it just became a, a special thing that that town did as they worked together. And for the next four and a half years, the people of North Platte and surrounding communities came to the train station every day with sandwiches and snacks and cold drinks and coffee and reading material and all kinds of other gifts. And sometimes they served as many as 8,000 soldiers a day. 
Over the course of World War II until the very last train arrived on April 1st, 1946, there were approximately six million soldiers who came through that train depot and received care packages from a city of only about 45,000 residents. But they were a city that were wholly given to a mindset of compassion. They didn't even know any of the soldiers, but they decided that they were gonna make a difference in the lives of those young men. A man by the name of Bob Green uh, captured that story. He wrote a book entitled Once Upon a Town in the 1990s that recounts that piece of history. And he said that in the 90s, he interviewed a few of the remaining soldiers that he found that still lived, men that had come through North Platte in the 1940s. And from his book, he says this, when I asked these men to tell me their remembrance of North Platte, they all had the same response. All of them wept. And thinking back more than 50 years prior, when those men remembered that town, they wept as they remembered the compassion that was shown to them by that city that was unified uh, to be a blessing to them in what would be one of the most traumatic times of life for them. Now, obviously, what we're talking about from the scriptures is immeasurably more important than giving a care package to a soldier going to war. But if even the world can figure out how to unify and be a blessing to needy or hurting souls in that way, how much more should God's people be able to make a difference if this whole church united together with hearts of compassion, recognizing what was truly important and caring for souls and making an eternal difference in their lives. Friends, the Bible says in the book of Jude, of some have compassion making a difference. Compassion makes a tremendous difference in people's lives. And we must have that unified mindset. I wonder what the response would be if we were to um, reach out to everyone that came here to True North Baptist Church and ask them 10 years later or 50 years later what took place in your life there? Would there be tears in their eyes and the words, somebody cared for me there? Somebody helped me there with a desperate need. Somebody counseled me and delivered God's word to me. Can you imagine what it would be like if everybody who came through this community could say, I experienced the care and the compassion and the love of God in that place. I wasn't used and abused there like I am everywhere else in the world in that city. The care of God's people for my soul made a difference. We need to understand that this is a mindset that God expects this church to have and to live out a unified mindset of compassion that's broken over the brokenness in people's lives. And so we're considering having compassion one of another, and we're talking about what the realm of compassion is. It involves a unified mindset where he says to this church, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. And we recognize that we're expanding that a little bit. Obviously, it's specifically in the context of our church body and considering one another in that way and being a help to one another. But it expands beyond that in Scripture as well. And so we have a compassionate, uh, unified mindset. And we also, in verse 8, uh, ought to have a pitiful mindset. All right? It says, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And so in addition to having compassion one of another, one of the identifiers of God's people is that he wants us to have loving hearts um, and be pitiful. And before any of you um, jump on the bandwagon and say, now that's one thing that I can do, I can be pitiful. Uh, it's not talking about our common usage of that word. The word pitiful lines right up with what we're talking about here in compassion. It means literally tender-hearted, tender-hearted. You know, it's so easy for, for some of us to just say to people going through troubles, you need to suck it up. <clears throat> you need to toughen up. Stop acting like such a baby. But when you know of somebody who's going through a difficult time, 
you should naturally respond with concern and care. There ought to be a deep level of compassion and pity and love that drives the members of this church in their association, their relationships with one another. Remember that in a church body, which is our primary context here, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. It's talking about this mindset of compassion. It's not God's desire for any of us to be Lone Ranger Christians and just go it alone in our difficulties or in any other times in life. When someone comes along your way, how can you help them? How can you care for them? What is it that you can do to be a blessing to them? And so we have the realm of compassion. It is all of God's people within a church, not just select individuals, although some are going to be explicitly gifted more in that way if they have the gift of mercy. But next, we also from our scripture here have what we could call the reach of compassion or the way that we actually reach into people's lives. Verse 9 says this, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. There's a blessing waiting for you. Well, notice that first of all, we reach out with compassion to one another verbally, verbally. Everything in verse 9 that I just read has to do with what we have to say. We're to give blessing, not rendering evil for evil, but contrarywise, we are to give blessing verbally. We are to reach out with positive words. Reach out with positive words. The word blessing is very interesting. It comes from the Greek word eulogio. We get our word eulogy from that. If you go to a funeral today, someone is most always designated to give what's called a eulogy. <laughs> what does that mean? They're words of blessing about the person who's gone on to eternity. God makes it very plain that he wants your words to be a blessing as you reach out in compassion. And so uh, this should touch us all in a very practical way, but instead of always having negative or sarcastic or harsh words, God wants us to train ourselves to reach out with spiritually driven verbal blessing as we come alongside someone and we have compassion on one another. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. It's just talking about the beautiful shimmering contrast that, uh, that, that just uh, attracts people and uh, is so pleasurable. Have you ever known someone who just seems to have the right words at the right time? They're people that make a difference for others. By contrast, there's a lot of people that have a very cutting and harsh uh, type of uh, speech or type of words towards other people, and they don't make a difference in a positive light. A man by the name of George Truitt was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, uh, beginning in the late 1800s. He was very, very close friends with the Dallas police uh, chief or the Dallas chief of police um, in the late 1800s. But in 1898, just a few years into his pastorate at that church, in Dallas, his heart was terribly broken when he accidentally killed the police chief. They went on a bird hunt together, and Truett accidentally discharged his shotgun into the police chief's leg. Now, they were successful in placing a tourniquet, but the chief died later in the day. George Truett's daughter, uh, in her Memoirs said that he never really laughed again after that. He spoke and even preached with a perpetually broken heart until his death. His own testimony was that he was going to quit the pastorate and he was going to quit the ministry because he felt so ineffective and so broken over that. But he was encouraged by many compassionate people in his church. So he continued. He ended up having a phenomenal ministry that lasted for 47 years as their pastor. Truett had a radio program, and he always closed the program with these words. 
be good to everybody because everybody is having a tough time. <laughs> Presumably reflecting back on his own difficulty that he had walked through. Well, uh, as we look at this scripture tonight, we can certainly say this, that as we talk about having compassion one of another as the Bible commands within our church, God wants us primarily to reach out verbally. And he wants us to do that in a positive way uh, during the course of just one week. How many hurting people do we encounter? How many people going through difficult times? How many people sitting right here in this church that need good words spoken to them? I'm not trying to be fluffy or flaky in what I'm saying here, but this is biblical counsel. Uh, people around us need a blessing. They need a eulogy. They need someone to encourage them. And so we reach out with positive words. We're also to reach out with peaceful words. In, uh, in verse 10, it says this, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. God intends for us to seek peace with others. Our words should bring peace into our relationships, not war. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Obviously, there's times when we stand for the truth, when there may be some appropriate division that's brought as a result of that. But we ought not just to be hard-headed, obstinate, calloused, uh, mean-spirited people that are just out to get our digs in on someone else. I mean, there's a lot of people that operate that way in different churches. That's not what God expects of us here. The phrase there, as much as lieth in you, means that sometimes we have to try really hard at this. It may not come easy. How many of you have that relative that's just a really cranky person and hard to get along with? How many of you have somebody at work that's always got an issue? They're always mad about something. They're always raging about something. How many of you know somebody at church like that? I hope that we don't. The Bible says that God wants us to be different. Not only should we have compassion on people, we should be people that speak peaceably. With everything in you, as much as possible, live peaceably. Sometimes it's not easy. And there are no doubt uh, people in your life every day who just seem like they're angry about something or they just want to fight about something. But God says in verse 11 of our text, you eschew evil, despise it, run away from it, do good, seek peace, and ensue that. And so there's something you ought to run from, and there's something that you ought to run to, and that's peace. And so we reach out. Um, we reach out with compassion verbally or with our words. And then we also reach out with Christ-likeness. And here we go back to verse 9 when he says, Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary-wise blessing. How do we keep from getting tied up with those difficult people that are always wanting to war? Well, you have to think and you have to plan and you have to be ready. You have to think spiritually. That's really the key, even if you're the object of the attack. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, as we talk about thinking in a Christ-like way and reaching out in a Christ-like way, Jesus said, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good that, to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You make sure that you withhold ungodly words and ungodly actions at all costs. I think in the Bible about the man named Job. Job chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us that there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. He ran away from it. As a result, he had a great testimony. You couldn't shake him up despite the tremendous catastrophe that came into his life. Uh, and then um, after that, his wife, who was really the one person that was left, coming to him and saying, just curse God and die. Get this over with. It's too miserable. And his friends telling him, um, God's failing you and you're failing him. But he kept his eyes on the Lord and he guarded his lips 
and he recognized what his words were designed to be used for. And so we have the realm of compassion, which is all the, the membership of a local church. And there's the reach of compassion where God says that he wants us to draw alongside one another and reach out with our words and Christ-like responses. As much as is in you, be the one that gives compassion. And then let me show you the reward of compassion that's spoken of in the rest of this portion of scripture. If you live a life of compassion, God's going to take note of it. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, folks, I want to tell you something here, and this is pretty obvious from what it says, but the Lord knows your testimony. He knows the way that you live. He sees when you're faithful. If somebody doesn't kindly respond to you, God sees it. If somebody verbally abuses you, God sees it. He knows our testimony. Uh, notice that very simple but wonderful verse here. In verse 12, once again, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. How many of you are thankful that we serve a God that can actually see? <laughs> we don't pray to a stone God. We don't pray to a Virgin Mary statue. We don't pray to some little Buddha doll. We pray to the living God. The eyes of the Lord are over us. He sees our lives. He sees our faithfulness. And then we listen to the second part of verse 12 where it says, And the ears of the Lord are open unto us. God hears us and God sees us and God judges. And sometimes we may find ourselves thinking, how can God let that bad guy have such a good life in this world and this good guy have such a bad life? Have you ever asked that? Seems like we encounter folks like that all the time. I can't always explain God's ways, but I can tell you this, that God promises that he'll make it right in his due time. God sees all these things. God sees when you're faithful. He sees when you're a peacemaker. God sees and hears your compassion, or he sees and hears your lack of compassion. Verse 12 says, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And I want you to understand that God's heart doesn't delight in judgment, but rather in compassion. Micah chapter 7 and verse 18 says, Who is God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And so God is patient, and he extends his mercy, and yet he will make things right. The believer can trust God to always judge in the right time and in the right way. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so we recognize that God knows our testimony. And so being compassionate is very important. And then we let the Lord take care of the rest. It doesn't mean that we don't balance that in a healthy way with the other one another commands that we've studied. I'm just giving you this particular uh, bird's eye view of this quality. And so even if you try to be kind to that family member, even if you try to be kind to that coworker, even if you try to be kind to your boss, but they render evil for evil, God's telling us that when we are rendering kindness, blessing, compassion, he sees that. And that's really what's critical. We want the Lord um, to be the one who, uh, who approves of our actions. And the issue is not how they act. You can't control what other people do, but you can always control your actions. God makes it plain through his word that he wants our actions and our reactions to be full of compassion. And then he'll judge those who are harsh and those who are wrong. That time will come. Uh, by the way, we shouldn't wish for it to come any faster than it's coming. Right now, he's trying to use us to make a difference in their lives. As we'll see in just a moment here, God knows your testimony and God rewards your faithfulness. And so in verse 14, it says, but if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. 
and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Uh, notice the phrase there, if ye suffer for righteousness' sake. And sometimes you may suffer just trying to be a blessing to others. That's just the, uh, the unfortunate wickedness of this world. Sometimes you may suffer just trying to witness or just trying to uh, give out a gospel tract or, or anything even as simple as that. As this society that we live in just becomes more and more ungodly, it might even mean at some point that Christians actually have to suffer for their faith a little bit. Maybe it's taking a stand um, that their co-worker or their boss or relative or acquaintance doesn't like, but God says in verse 14 that even when the persecution comes, you can still be happy. That's the statement. There doesn't need to be any fear, but happiness should be present. Uh, teenagers, young adults, whoever you are, when you stand up for something that's right, when somebody says, hey, let's go to a party, and then they mock you because you don't, when you ought to behave yourself maturely and your friends make fun of you kids, Adults, when you choose to stand for the truth that runs against the grain of this society, happy are ye because you're doing what God wants you to do. And that's really all that matters. And God says that he's going to reward your faithfulness when you take a stand for the right and for truth. God's going to take care of you. And though we shouldn't wish for it to be hastened, God will judge those eventually who don't, uh, who don't live according to his word. And so Luke chapter 6 and verse 22 Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. Bring it on, for behold, great is your reward in heaven. For in like manners did their fathers unto the prophets. When people mistreat you, God will take care of you. He'll remember your faithfulness. And so I want to challenge you today to choose to have compassion one of another within this church. And I also want to remind you that it's only possible to do that by God's grace in your life. It's not something that we can easily create or muster up out of our own sinful hearts. It takes the grace of God. Well, in conclusion, some of you know who Corey Ten Boom was. She was a lady from Amsterdam. It is most famously known because her entire family was taken into prisoner of war camps under Adolf Hitler. While they were in the prisoner of war camps, both of her parents and her one sister were murdered, and she alone was spared in her family. She survived, and after the war, she was in the city of Munich. She was attending a church, and she was sharing her testimony about compassion and about forgiveness. And she told about the terrible atrocities that she experienced in the prisoner of war camp at Ravensbrück. And she said, I'm thankful that God forgave me and that by God's grace, I can forgive others. That was her testimony, it was a good one. After the service, something happened that she wasn't at all expecting. There was a man who came and shook her hand and said, Ma'am, the testimony that you've shared today is a great encouragement to me. To know that God would forgive me for all my sin. And as she looked into his face and studied him for a moment, she realized that it was one of the guards from Ravensbrook who had mistreated her family and so many of her loved ones. And she said that at that moment, she literally froze and there was no forgiveness in her only fear. And she said that as she looked at him, the, the pale, ashen face of her dead sister came rushing back to her mind as she remembered what they'd done to her. And then she gathered her wits and she prayed, Lord, I just spoke about forgiveness. Help me to forgive. Help me to have compassion on this man who now says that he believes in you. And she related that suddenly there was a, a calm and a warmth that came through her body as the love of God began to stir her heart. 
And she looked into the man's eyes and she said, yes, the forgiveness of God is a wonderful thing. I'm so glad that we can both experience it today. I want to tell you something. You can hold on to bitterness and indifference towards others. Or you can ask the Lord to give you compassion. Those are the two roads that you can go down. You can render railing for railing. Fight with your relatives. Fight with your neighbors. Fight with your co-workers. Fight with your fellow church members. Or you can have compassion as you look to the real spiritual needs in their souls that underlies all that behavior. When you live a life of compassion, doors will begin to open for you. And I want you to see what I'm talking about here, and then we're done. Verse 15 says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And this may be a scripture that you're very familiar with, and you've heard many times before. We get our concept of apologetics from it. But it flows out of what we just talked about. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If you intend to live a life of, of blessing rather than cursing, if you intend to live a life uh, of compassion rather than bitterness and indifference, then God says you'd better be ready. You better be ready to give an answer to everybody who asks why you have such hope in you. They're going to say, I don't understand it. I was so angry and you were just kind to me. And listen, all those problems are still going to be raging around you, but you still smile and you look beyond the sin to see the needs of the soul. A church member is going to be touched by you keeping a gracious, compassionate focus and drawing alongside them to help them. Somebody else is going to look at you and say, uh, everybody is clamoring all around us about politics, about race, about rights, about government abuses. They're all the people on the internet that are constantly baiting for arguments, and yet you seem to stay above it all. How do you do that? God says that you better be ready to give an answer to everybody that asks a reason of the hope that's in you. What is it that gives you hope that lifts you above all of that trash? Wouldn't it be something to strive for, to have your life so compassionately different that somebody came up to you this week and said, what's so different about you? You, you seem to have something on the inside that I just don't see a lot. Why is it that when everybody else is fuming, <laughs> you're happy? Why is it that every time there's a need that you try to help meet that need, what's so different about you? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could say, I'll tell you what's different about me. 28 years ago, I realized that I was a sinner, lost without hope, and facing God's judgment. But I heard a message about Jesus Christ who died to save me from my sins. And even though I deserved death, God's grace and God's compassion was offered to me. And I found forgiveness. And whatever your story is, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, or 6 months ago, God saved me. And ever since then, I have happiness because I know Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens on this earth, I'm still on the winning side. Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody asked you this week, what is it in you that's so different and so compassionate? Everybody else in this world is at war, but you genuinely care. Why is that? Well, God's compassion is what makes the difference. And he calls on us to make a difference also as we reflect his compassion on people who desperately need him. There's a progression here. God has compassion on us. We have compassion one of another in this church. And then we take that compassion and we turn it to the world and we make a difference. I pray that as God does his work in our hearts tonight, we'll learn to have compassion and then God will open doors for us to share the love and compassion of Jesus Christ even this very week. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks for the privilege to just open your word and trust that your Holy Spirit takes the truth of it and applies it to our hearts. We thank you for how you can melt our hearts of stone. And I pray that you would purge from our lives harshness, 
harsh speech, harsh mentality. Help us to genuinely look past all the things that tend to rile us up and frustrate us and just be able to see the real spiritual needs that lie behind some of those sinful behaviors in the lives of other people as well. And that we would, as a church, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Thank you for True North Baptist Church, for all of our members and families and, and guests. And, and we just pray for you to be able to do a work in and through us so that we would be able to turn with your compassion to this world and truly reach out to people and make a difference. Thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you and to be a part of your work. And I pray that you'll continue to do your work in our hearts tonight. You'll find us making steadfast commitments to experience change in this area and permanent change. And we'll be able to go out and show your love and compassion to others throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I thank you for your attention tonight. It's a, a real treat for us to be able to have Brother Travis here and Sister Teresa. And uh, we've been praying for you guys, and we're excited that you were able to drop in on your really short stay. We appreciate you coming and gracing us with your presence. And so I'm going to turn over the floor to Brother Travis. Look forward to him being able to share just a little bit here about what's going on, or, or share a lot. Take as much time as you want, brother.